Thank you to our committee members who are with us today. We are in the midst of a public health crisis that has already killed more than 70,000 Americans, and the federal government is failing to respond. If we're going to meet the challenge of this moment, we must learn the lessons of history. The federal response to Hurricane Katrina under the leadership of Lieutenant General Honore, once he was appointed by President George W. Bush to lead the joint uh, task force, showed the importance of early preparedness, coordination, and strong federal leadership when catastrophe strikes. Instead of heeding this example, the current administration has had a shifting set of agencies and task forces responding to the coronavirus crisis. No single agency or person in charge. Unlike in Hurricane Katrina response, there is no central unified command to address the current crisis. Earlier this year, the White House announced a task force chaired by the vice president. But the president and vice president have recently given conflicting signals about whether it will continue. The FEMA administrator was initially left out of the task force, but weeks later, FEMA was named the lead agency for the federal response only after this committee repeatedly pushed FEMA to testify before Congress and FEMA uh, administrator Peter Gaynor agreed to brief the committee in March. Now FEMA has indicated it may also play a reduced role. In the meantime, the federal go government lost critical time to prepare for and respond to this crisis. Because there has not been a centralized federal procurement effort, states have largely been left to fend for themselves and bid against each other on the open market for critical testing supplies and personal protective equipment. This is absurd and unacceptable. Rather than address these problems, the president has claimed they don't exist. For example, on Tuesday, he said, quote, we have the greatest testing in the world, and we have the most testing in the world, end quote. That is not true. Yet he has insisted on reopening the economy despite the risks. Simply put, we do not have enough testing, we do not have enough protective equipment, and we do not have an effective federal centralized response to these challenges. The administration is proclaiming mission accomplished while thousands of Americans are dying every day. The United States now has the highest number of coronavirus infections and deaths of any country in the world. And the pace of this horrific pandemic is not slowing down. Thank you again to Lieutenant General Ray for being with us to share your experience and advice about how to improve the federal response to this crisis. And I will now uh, turn this over to our distinguished ranking member, Heiss, for his brief opening remarks. Representative Heiss. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. We appreciate it very much. And Lieutenant General Honore, thank you for your lifelong service to our country. And we thank you for joining us this afternoon. Honestly, we're under different circumstances, but we appreciate you being here. Rather than returning to and finding ways to help our country recover and reopen from this pandemic. My colleagues across the aisle are instead using the crisis to engage in political gamemanship. It's sad, the majority is fixated on politicizing every action of President Trump rather than focusing on the real issue affecting the American people at this time. Instead of another round, of political attacks, we should be focusing on things like the Chinese Communist Party uh, and holding them accountable for hiding the truth about this virus from the world. We should be focusing on things like ensuring the success of the largest relief effort in American history. We should be focused on providing clear and immediate guidance regarding how to safely reopen and reinvigorate our, our economy so that hardworking American people can get back to work. We sent you a letter about a week ago, uh, Chair, requesting hearings regarding the Communist Party of China's devious propaganda efforts and the glaring shortcomings at the World Health Organization 
that you yourself admitted needs to be corrected. This is a critical moment in our nation's history. Never before in this country has every state, tribe, and territory in the U.S. been approved for a major disaster declaration at the same time. As a result, FEMA, HHS, and the White House Task Force have stepped up to the task. They've engaged in an unprecedented whole of America response to this pandemic. And in contrast, this committee is holding a briefing today designed to do nothing more than attack the president and give the media cheap and easy headlines and talking points for their brazenly biased coverage. We're hosting this briefing online because Speaker Pelosi won't let the House come back to work. We have farmers, grocers, truck drivers, frontline healthcare workers, and so many others who are all on the front line working every single day. And it's frustrating to know that we are asking Americans to do what we ourselves are not willing to do. It's past time for Congress to get back to work. This is a national emergency. And everyone but us seems to understand that. The Senate is at work. The president is at work. Uh, the task force is at work. Uh, and instead, we are using webcams for an obviously partisan briefing that isn't even official committee business. I hope the majority can move past these absurd, time-wasting political attacks and move on to conducting legitimate oversight so that the American people can know the truth. And with that, I'll yield back. Okay, now I, I'd like to introduce uh, our, our honoree and our honored uh, speaker today. Lieutenant General Honoré is a true American hero. He served for 37 years in the U.S. Army and led our nation's military response to several natural disasters, as well as the Space Shuttle Columbia tragedy and the D.C. sniper shootings. In 2005, after the Bush administration's initial response to Hurricane Katrina proved inadequate, General Honoré was appointed to lead a joint task force to coordinate the federal government's recovery efforts. General Honoré has rightfully received widespread acclaim for his lifetime of service to our country and for his leadership in times of crisis. We are truly honored to have you with us today and I will now turn it over to you for your opening remarks. Thank you for coming. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, uh, Congress Lady Mahoney and uh, Mr. Heights for your comments and welcome. I must tell you, I don't have a lot of experience at doing these hearings, but I can recall one, uh, once I got back to Atlanta from Hurricane Katrina, and uh, the week before I went up to the Senate for uh, that hearing, uh, a couple of federal agents showed up and downloaded my computer and took every email and text message I had sent through the entire experience. So, uh i have some familiarity with the oversight of uh the legislative body and uh but it ended up being a good experience because we got to tell our story and it was documented by them having every email i sent over a six-week period while leading katrina i retired in 2008 but i did not leave the space for which i thought our nation could consistently do better with from lessons from katrina and that is creating a culture of preparedness. While Katrina was a natural response, uh, once I left the uh, Army, I got into the lecture circuit. I've written three books, one of them, Survival, uh, How Do We Prepare for uh, Disasters, Man-Made and or Natural. And then uh, wrote a book called Leadership in a New Normal. Uh, that book focused uh, primarily on situations like we're dealing with today, global uh, events that can happen that threaten the security of our nation. And the last one is don't get stuck on stupid. Don't keep doing the same thing over if it's not working. Uh, when, and I wrote that after the 2017 hurricane season. So I've stayed engaged in this space of military support to civil authorities, as well as familiarity and uh, stay current on the national response uh, framework, which is used by the federal government to deal with uh, all the known type and potential disasters that hit our country. 
And as we uh, have dealt with that since uh, 2000, I served on the joint staff as the principal officer uh, from the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff with military support to civil authority. Uh, I've been to those uh, national security meetings uh, as a deputy and sometime as a as stand-in for the chairman dealing with strategic issues facing our nation in terms of security and with military support of the homeland. We participated in the, the work that was done to finish the work that under presidential decision five that stood up our Homeland Security and Department of Homeland Security, as well as Northern Command. So that's the extent of my experience and I've just stayed engaged uh, in this space uh, and do about 20 to 30 speeches a year to governmental agencies and uh, industry across the country. With that being said, uh, what we are faced with here today is an unprecedented uh, event in the history of our country. Uh, going back to the other uh, last 100 years, uh, 100 years ago, 200, in, in 1918, we, we were struggling uh, on the eve of going to war in World War I and we were deploying troops to Europe that were suffering from what has been commonly called the influence of 1918 or the Spanish flu. Uh, as far as a overview of where I think we are today, I gave my first interview uh, as it was on, nine, on the 27th February on uh, Fox News. And at that point in time, uh, one of the talking points that day based on the question was we need to have unity of effort in our government, that everyone need to work together, and that the federal government needed to support the states. I repeated that message again on 27 March uh, with the emphasis on executing a national strategy uh, for the uh, logistics as well as for the uh, testing equipment to test, test, test. And uh, uh, recently the president, and the White House, uh, in conjunction with the task force, uh, published a document on 19 March called the opening up of America again. And uh, my concern, again, remains that in that document, uh, it states that the federal government is the last resort for supply that support testing and PPE. And that is the problem I have today as I see a shortfall in the government's plan and execution that the federal government has not taken ownership of the requirement to provide PPE as well as uh, test, 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 trace and uh, contact supplies to the state. In this document, it shows that the federal government is the last source of those supply and that need to be fixed and the other observation I have is that we have not optimized the Defense Production Act. I appreciate this opportunity to speak with you, and I look forward to engaging in your dialogue. Just a reminder that each member will have two minutes to allow enough time for all members to ask questions. Once recognized, please wait for confirmation that you have been unmuted before asking your question. Our first question will be from chair from our chairwoman. Chairwoman Maloney, you have the floor. Thank you, and thank you, General Honore. You were the commander of a unified DOD FEMA task force charged with responding to Hurricane Katrina after the inadequate initial federal response uh, led by FEMA. Uh, why, why do you think it's so important in responding to Katrina to have had a unified task force, and do you believe a similar approach is necessary to respond to the coronavirus crisis? I do think that would help. We're dealing with 50 states, we're dealing with 50 governors, and on any given day, that could be a challenge into itself. So this virus operation uh, is bigger, but the principles remain the same. I, I do think if it's one thing that the administration could do is that we've seen many different changes um, as who is the lead person uh, putting out policy, doing risk communications, as well as responding to the requests of, of the governors. And I do think 
the, the better decisions were made when they had communications clear and who was doing what. And over time, as the administration has shifted, which is option they have, more toward opening the economy uh, as opposed to public health, I, I do think we're still seeing 2,000 people die a day. And none of the predictions we had over a month ago that we would be past the curve and moving on. And uh, I think this is attributed to uh, a dual priority of saving lives and opening the economy. And that's a dilemma. Every administration's got to deal with that. They've got to set priorities. But I do think the absence of that unified uh, command uh, is, is showing itself evident uh, in what we're doing. I, uh, I, I am really uh, concerned about the fact that uh, the administration has not gotten states the coronavirus testing supplies. Everybody says we won't get over it till everyone's tested and personal protective equipment that these ne states need to safely uh, reopen their economies. Instead, FEMA has told us they are merely supporting the state's plans and letting the private sector take the lead. So my question is, what can we do to get testing supplies into every state and to everyone who needs it? Uh, this is a country that put a man on the moon. Why can't we get testing kits out to all the people who need it in our country? Well, I think that's why uh, in the powers of this democracy, we gave the president the power of the Defense Production Act. I mean, that was a hard fought and he bit a pill to swallow to execute that in America. And I learned to look up to use it. But that's why we have it. The number one function of government in America is to save this country, to secure it. And right now, we're being attacked by an enemy that's killing over 2,000 of our people every day. It's, it's no time to leave something in reserve. We've got to go off the defense and move to the offense. And to move to the offense, we need to tell as many plants as we have to to produce testing kits. This is not an option on whether they want to do it. We've taken an entrepreneurial approach and allowed each state to try and cut contracts locally. And now as the states start to get in this, we know what's going to happen. Well, we're going to end up with um, uh, local testing companies. Some of them are very reputable. Others are getting in this to the first time and we're going to have 50 different solutions to testing i do think the white house has a good plan uh and the administration uh, for opening up america the problem is it's out of sequence it's not resourced right you got to get the testing right and it has to be the logistics of that need to come from the federal government right now we have every governor out there are uh, trying to buy test equipment and trying to buy PPE. And oh, by the way, they're competing with FEMA for a limited supply. We've seen what the country can do. The president went and looked at a warehouse in Arizona the other day. We should have 10 of those operating. We should have five or six different companies, big companies making our test equipment. We've got the capacity. I think we need to go from an entrepreneurial approach and letting uh, this joint venture with industry, uh, figure it out with the governors. We need to execute the national response plan and have the federal government in charge of logistics and uh, appoint a military headquarters to assist FEMA in the execution and the distribution. Of that. That's my opinion, ma'am. Oh, well, thank you very much uh, for your, your service to our country. Uh, I, I'd also uh, we're having trouble getting the personal protective equipment. Would it be the same answer for the personal pr protective equipment? They did create the air bridge because, as you know, most of the PPE that we've used, much of it has come actually from China or by way of other countries from China, which was the primary producer. And again, there's a lesson learned there that we need to be uh, PPE independent in the country. And I hope. Uh, you members are taking note of that the next time budget come around that we make sure our PPE is uh, produced or in the United States or in, in its own hand in sufficient qualities. That being said, the air bridge was uh, installed. Then one day at the uh, one of the updates, we got an admiral came up, one of my fellow officers, and said, 
we're flying it in and we give some of it to the people who order it, the governors and the uh, cities, and the other part we give to private industry to sell. I've never heard of that technique used before in all the government. And I don't think it's worked. And it's costing the federal government twice. Because on one hand, FEMA is giving the governors money to buy PPE. And on the other hand, they're having to go out with local PPE distributors and compete for them uh, for, the, with the, for the same product. So uh, this is going to be something else to audit. I don't know how they're going to audit this thing. When they see a governor pay $7 for a mask in some cases, and then you've got private companies selling them for uh, $6.99. Uh, th this is going to be a mess. And this is something you members of the Congress are going to have to uh, put some rules in to make sure this doesn't happen again. Because we don't want to repeat on that. I think everybody's working hard, but this is not working with a unity of effort. The federal government needs to be in charge of logistics. We do this well every day. The United States government does logistics globally. We have large aircraft. We have military logistics units. We have something called the Defense Logistics Agency. We have the Army Military Air Command. We have the Air Force. We know how to do this. But I think this uh, uh, experiment with uh, with uh, with the private industry is one that I, I don't want to see repeated again. Thank you so much for your insight and your comments and your life's work. And I yield back uh, to the next question. Next, we will have um, Representative Heiss. Representative Heiss, you are unmuted to ask a question. Thank you very much. And again, General, we appreciate you being here today. Listen, how important is it to have accurate information when we're dealing with a national emergency? Well, so that is that is significant. And uh, to have the right numbers and to do uh, you know, the, the way, particularly when we're dealing with, if I may use this a pandemic as an example, uh, we want to be on the offense. And when we hear an epidemic strike, we want to deploy there. We want to get early information uh, from the host nation. Hopefully we have access. Most of the time we do. If we don't, we work with uh, W, with the World Health Organization. Uh, but it is very important to have accurate information. If you don't have accurate information, you're shooting at the wrong target and you're shooting late. So when China propagated false information uh, in an attempt to uh, cover up this pandemic, it really hindered the president and our agencies from responding because they didn't have accurate information uh, to know what they were dealing with, right? I think that's a fair observation. When, when the country of China uh, was not forthcoming with all the information and there are very many variables to how much the U.S. knew when, but it's something I don't have access to anymore is intelligence. <laughs> but uh, I watch the news like you for timing of that and what's been said from the administration. But it's clearly uh, that the uh, host nation could have done a lot better job. And right now it's cost us over 70,000 lives of Americans in 2009 a day because we didn't get this right up front and stopped it where it was. Okay, thank you, sir. I know two minutes goes in a hurry, so I'll yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Heiss. Next, we will go to Mr. Raskin. Mr. Raskin, you are now unmuted. Thank you very much, Mr. Honore. Thank you for your testimony, um, which is sobering indeed. Uh, you describe something like helter-skelter chaos in terms of the U.S. government's response to this pandemic, which has already cost us 75,000 American lives with more than 1.2 million of our people infected and 30 million Americans newly thrown out of work. Um, I was moved when you said, we know how to do this. You said, We've got the Defense Logistics Agency. We've got military logistics. We've got the Air Force. We've been through this before. So if you could explain to those of us whose field this is not, we are not expert in like you are, what went wrong here? 
well, why did we throw out all of those old systems of logistics and defense logistics agency for the chaos and the pitting the states against each other and the private contractors running amok? I did then went for, um, when you form a task force, uh, as this was done, you sometime lose the legacy uh, knowledge of the national response plan. And, and I'll tell you, the Congress and the Senate worked this hard with the administration after 9-11 to prepare, to prepare our nation, to protect our nation against all threats known, foreign and domestic, as well as uh, pandemics. And there is a pandemic uh, uh, document for response in the national response format. So, and in 2005, President Bush, uh, my old boss, he, he signed that with a pandemic response plan and then was subsequently updated uh, primarily during the Ebola event during the uh, Obama administration where they appointed someone in the White House as the, uh, on the National Security Council to work this. And then from that uh, understanding of how to execute the national response plan, we went to the, uh, uh, the administration where they appointed the vice president as the head of the task force. Uh, I think what happened is we didn't see the upfront uh, presentations by the CDC and the role that HHS played uh, when that running this operation went directly to the White House. Uh, and I think everybody wanted to do what they thought the administration wanted to do. But when you're operating at that level, with that degree of, of visibility, I think we lost along the way those decisions that used to come out of National Security Council, which would devise the policy for the agencies like FEMA, uh, HHS, and CDC to execute. That we subplanted the National Security Council with the task force for policy. That's who normally draft the president's and the, the National Command Authority policy. And when we skip that level, we're still trying to recover from that. And when it went back to FEMA sometime in March to execute the logistics portion of this, we still have not gotten this thing synchronized. Well, Mr. Honore, I know that they can call and give what they need. I'm sorry for a long answer. No, not at all. Just let me close with this then. Uh, the president has said we are at war with the virus. Um, do you believe that the U.S. government has a plan to win this war? Do you think we're winning it now? Uh, I can't say we win it when we have friends and loved ones and fellow citizens dying at a rate of 2,000 a day. And that number could double in the next 30 days. We're not winning. We're surviving. Do we have a plan? I think we, we have to go on the offense. And the key to any major campaign like this is you have to dominate the battlefield with logistics and with people to execute test, 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 contain, uh, or track and trace. Uh, you know, if we had an enemy on our border shooting at us, we would unleash all of government in the Department of Defense to go deal with that. That's why the Department of Defense exists is to secure the United States of America. And they're, they're there. We got the great National Guard working in every state. But if I had 20 minutes with the president, we would uh, scope this thing out and go back into the National Response Plan, put it back on keel, put a four-star general admiral that's in command to be in charge of distributing the, the PPE and acquiring the PPE and working with HHS using the Defense Production Act to produce uh, testing where we could test every America at least twice in the next 12 months. Well, I appreciate that very much. And Madam Chair, I'll just close by saying this is why I support the Reopen America Act because it attempts to do precisely what Mr. Honore is talking about, which is to mobilize the machinery of the federal government to take, to coordinate the logistics, to stop pitting the states against each other, and to develop the national plan we need to win this war and to execute a real strategy. I yield back and I thank you very much.
Thank you, Mr. Raskin. Our next question will be from Ms. Norton. Ms. Norton, you are now unmuted. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and I hope you can hear me. Yes, ma'am. Um, um, first, uh, General Henri, I wanted to thank you because your invaluable experience is the closest we have uh, to anything that can help guide us uh, as we try to reopen our country. Now, I am uh, noted, I note that throughout the United States, we have states appearing to be on their own. Of course, they, they have to look at their own statistics. Uh, I, I applaud that. But I wonder if you have had an opportunity to look at the few other countries uh, that are beginning to open and what they did that we are not doing that we could ourselves use as a guide guide a guide given the fact that there are a few countries ahead of us and beginning to su successfully open i appreciate your views on that well uh thank you for that question thank you for uh, help leading our country and the things that you do ma'am i would say this I've spent time in Korea and I watched the Korea model very, very close. They were decisive, they were deliberate, and they went on the attack. They, they went on the offense immediately. They went into uh, mitigation measures in the, uh, and told people to stay home, literally off the street. And they closed everything down other than supply chain where people could get food, uh, they went quickly to electronic tracing of people. They went quickly to within hours if somebody came in contact uh, and been notified that they were uh, positive. Within minutes, uh, the people that that person who came positive were contacted and told to go to an isolation. I think the Korean model, a little country about the size of Kentucky that I've spent four years of my life in, all of the great things we work with them on practicing and warfare and survival uh, and using technology, they got it. And that would be one of the models that I know can work because we've seen it work. And uh, I've followed that particular response very close. I think that would be a good model. And they have mastered the part about testing. Is it too, too late for? Uh, any of the states to follow that model now, given uh, how deep our own crisis is? Or do you think that states could, in fact, align with that model, regardless of what the federal government is doing, and uh, begin to open based on that model and, of course, on the CDC guidelines? Well, I think to execute the career model as it was done, we would have to really get more buy-in from the American people in terms of uh, stay at home because the Koreans did that, there was unity there. And, and we're, a big, we're a bigger country, which makes it more dynamic, and we're a more polarized country in many ways. But the Korean model work, uh, governors, if they're looking for how to do testing, there's certainly things that certainly can be replicated here. But we would need the Defense Production Act, and we need the federal government to take ownership of testing, supplies and PPE, and then put a, a sign at headquarters that address the American people daily about what's the status of those supplies, when the testing is going to happen, and strictly deal with the updates and lessons learned on what people need to know the public on how to keep themselves alive and how they can help the government solve this problem. Because unless the American people buy into this, we will not defeat this enemy. I'm just telling you right now. And we seem to be having just the opposite. They're buying into opening up and very, 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 uh, uh, very, very uh, frustrated about being uh, shut in. So thank you, Madam Chair. And I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Norton. Um, just before we go to the next question, I just want to remind everyone about the raise hand feature um, that's located under, under the participants um, panel, or you can email our staff directly on the thread that was sent around to staff to ask a question. 
um, or directly in the chat. Um, next, we will go to Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Ms. Wasserman Schultz, you are now unmuted. Thank you so much. And General Honoré, thank you for your service to our nation. And uh, and as, uh, as a representative from a state that also got hit by Hurricane Katrina, um, I want to thank you for uh, for your for quarterbacking the aftermath of that effort. And my my question is in that uh, in that vein, um, being from a state that is uh, smack at the front of Hurricane Alley, um, and with hurricane season beginning in less than a month, uh, with the challenges that we've seen FEMA deal with with PPEs and the supplies necessary, both in terms of moving them around and making sure they are distributed in an organized uh, way that ensures that those who need those supplies and resources can get them. Um, in hurricane season, uh, in the aftermath of a hurricane, you know, we're only dealing with usually a, a smaller part of the country and everybody else in the country is, is proceeding as normal. This is the entire country that is that is faced with this and we are going to be dealing with uh, COVID-19 for likely a, a year. Um, and, and we could have spikes as we reopen, we likely will. So my question is, do you see, and I realize you don't have inside information, but in your experience, is, is FEMA ready to both manage the aftermath of what is now predicted that just came out this week to be a unusually active hurricane season? And I certainly hope that's not accurate. Um, as well as the response that they will need to continuously be be, uh, be engaged in to COVID-19? You know, uh, thanks for that question. In 2017, uh, we had a, a unprecedented event, and that was full hurricane cycle over back-to-back -back Harvey, Irma, uh, right. and Maria. Those hurricanes came in and uh, they overwhelmed the system. FEMA wasn't designed to deal with that many, and we saw what happened. As a result of that, we're still cleaning up efforts in Harvey. Those houses in Houston's uh, under the HUD program still hadn't been rebuilt. Uh, in the Virgin Islands, uh, phase one of uh, FEMA recovery still hadn't been, the contractors hadn't been paid, and that's being handled by FEMA Region 2 out of New York. And the same thing in Puerto Rico. Uh, the right. housing replacement program they have not started, and those hurricanes happened in 2017. I do think uh, like we have added something else to the plate that's going to challenge FEMA's ability to deal with our active hurricane season. Now is the time for the National Security Council to reorganize uh, how we're going to deal with hurricane season because it's coming. And when we have a hurricane bearing down on a place like Miami or Jacksonville or New Orleans or Houston, we can't ask that same organization to be there to back up the governors. We need to reorganize and use uh, our backup plan is to use the military. That's why we that's why we've got it. to have full a uh, pay and I hope uh, members of Congress will support that full pay and allowances so every governor can use all the national guard they need to use. Right now, that limitation is Title 32 money. So the Guard need to be fully up, ready to respond inside the state without having to work and preposition of supplies in each state along the coast based on that and preposition of federal uh, helicopters and medical capacities to go help those states because we're gonna see a hurricane season like we never saw before, man. How do we do sheltering? How are we gonna adjust our sheltering plan? Right. How are we going to adjust our evacuation route? How are we going to adjust when one governor said, no, y'all had a lot of uh, COVID down there. You can't come to my state or you can't stop in it or you've got to go in isolation. So what I would say, you lawmakers have a lot of work to do <laughs> to get this sorted out because it's going to be up to y'all working this with the uh, executive branch and the agencies on how we're going to really be prepared for hurricane season next month. Thank you. I, I certainly hope they're ready. Uh, it doesn't. I'm going to start asking questions of them directly as well. Thank you so much, General. I yield back, Madam Chair.
Hi, right, thank you. Thank you. Next, we will go to Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Sarbanes, you are now unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, General, thanks very much uh, for your for your briefing us today. Um, my question is, obviously, this is the uh, the committee on oversight and reform. So, uh, going forward, our challenge is to figure out how to do oversight, um, both with respect to the response, the health response, how the economic relief assistance is going out the door. But increasingly, uh, with each day, the oversight is going to be focused on the recovery dimension of this, the reopening piece of it, which is, um, as we've already discussed, it's it's uneven across the country. That makes it difficult for people, I think, to uh, absorb guidance in a way that results in a consistent set of best practices. So we're going to have to wrestle with that. Can you give us your advice as we do the oversight? Where should we turn to to get the data um, to ask the right questions? Where, where should we be looking? Um, you know, obviously there's federal agencies and that's an important place for us to turn and get testimony and get, um, you know, information and so forth. And, and we'll do that. but. If you were <clears throat> if you were guiding us on how to pull to get pull together the best picture in order to do our oversight, where else would you ask us to to turn? Would you say uh, go to these governors? You know, go to the governor of a big state and go to the governor of a small state. Would you say here are the five or six large nonprofit NGO organizations that are operating on the front lines? and you should tap into them in order to get a picture. Would you recommend that we go to uh, unions, for example, that represent workers that are in these frontline uh, positions and, and get their input? How do we, how do we get around um, a lot of the noise and get to the places where we can get the most accurate information or warnings about what's happening in terms of the response, in terms of the recovery, in terms of the reopening. So if you could maybe just describe some of the categories of data sources that your experience suggests are a good place, a good resource for us, um, that I think could be very helpful to us as we move forward. Thank you, sir. I must qualify and say my experience in dealing with that level of response was uh, the beginning of the response to Hurricane Katrina. Uh, I must tell you this, I know cities and states are hurting. Uh, 10 days into Katrina, Man Nagan, who uh, came to me and he said, General, uh, I need to make payroll next week and we don't have any money. And I looked at him and I said, what do you mean you don't have any money? He said, well, we all our businesses are closed. We stopped collecting tax. We only had about 30 days of cash on hand, and we spent much of that will go out into overtime and, and other money we had to spend. We out of money. I said, well, why are you telling me? I, I'm a federal officer. He said, well, President Bush told me if I needed something to talk to you. And turned around and we called the White House. I said, hey, this mayor is out of money. He can't make payroll. And someone called back from the White House Chief of Staff Office and said, tell him to call this bank, they're gonna cover his payroll. That's my experience with that because I knew from Katrina, looking at this a month ago, sir, that people were gonna be out of money. Because when the cities are closed and they're not collecting money, they don't have a lot of cash on hand, particularly smaller cities like New Orleans that rely on uh, on tourism and sales tax. We've got a 10% sales tax in Louisiana. And when they stop selling and a, a much of that economy is closed down, I would think that's the type of people you want to talk to, sir, is the mayors and the governors 
and some of their key people doing that by region or by state in the hot spots. Because I think the hot spots, sir, are going to be the one that's most affected because they've been in a total shutdown. But that would be my recommendation, and that's been my experience sir, in, in, in dealing with those issues associated with how do we keep people alive, how do we take care of our American people, and how they have confidence that the American government is going to take care of them, regardless of hell or high water. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, I'll, I'll yield back, but I just would ask maybe that we, as a committee, uh, think about what those sets of data points could be so that as we move forward, we're coming back to, to some consistent sources which will allow us to measure progress or frustrations. Um, and I think that can include elected officials like mayors and governors, but I think if we could find, um, you know, six or seven nonprofits or NGOs, organizations that are working in various spaces um, and get a read from them on what's happening, in a sense, on the front lines of the, the reopening, the response and the reopening, so that we can come back to them periodically and judge whether you know, what's happened in between. And we could think of other data sets like that uh, because there's so much to process right now from so many different sources that if we kind of careen from one source to the next, we could lose some sustained perspective on this, on the situation. So um, I'd, be, I'd be interested in working with the committee to, to help identify those. General, thank you for your service and thanks for your testimony uh, and uh, briefing today. Thank you, John. Thank you, Mr. Sarbanes. Next, we will go to Mr. Grothman. Mr. Grothman, you are unmuted. Okay, I, I have a couple of questions. Um, first of all, as far as dealing with the coronavirus crisis, um, I, I know, you know you're in charge of, to a certain extent, uh, getting PPE, uh, you know, sometimes building additional facilities. Um, and I wonder with regard to the PPE, when you design the amount that you've got to get a hold of nationwide, um, did you have a projected number of hospital patients, say, as of March 1st, April 1st, May 1st, and June 1st, or something like that? Uh, um, and has that gone up and down over time? So uh, I uh, I want to make clear I, I'm an observer in that and have done a lot of uh, the response to in, in media analysis, but I, I'm not I can tell you what I saw like you. What I've seen is that they use the model depending on uh, that was based on the amount of patients and the amount of beds they would need, which drove the number of ventilators, which drove the number of PPE. But I think we way underestimated the PPE requirements because of the you mean, this virus. We way underestimated it because the states, the number of days supply most of them had on hand was inadequate because you're not just picking the patient up when they walk in the hospital. You got the people that transport them. You got the people that they were living with. You got the people who drive the train and brought them to the doctor. So. I, I do think we've learned a lot from that. And with all due respect to not having the right numbers right now, I think that attributed to some of the problems. And it wasn't until we were weeks in this before FEMA was tagged to lead the logistics effort to try to acquire the PPE, sir. You, you, your, your answer kind of stuns me. I, I mean, I was under the impression uh, from what's going on here that the projected number of people hospitalized, say six weeks ago, compared to the number that were hospitalized, was very much lower now compared to six weeks ago. And I've heard the same thing from other parts of the country. But you are telling me the projected hospitalizations is actually higher than was anticipated six weeks ago? No, uh, that might be my Louisiana accent minor trip that the initial estimates sir uh had all of the estimates that's why all the expanded bids were built out in new york and new orleans 
they expected more people to be hospitalized and needed ventilators. But that did not translate itself into how much PPE they would need, not only for the medical staff, but the the uh, the entire okay. chain of people and the people in nursing homes and the people in prisons and the people that work in the food chain and, and the people on ships, sir. Okay. Well, could you just then give me an estimate, say, where where you thought we'd be uh, two months ago on total number of patients, uh, where you think, where, where, the, where the prediction was, where we'd wind up, say, on May 1st and June 1st, and where we did wind up on May 1st? Well, I think two months ago, we, we were, the, the estimates coming out of the White House was nowhere in the thousands. Uh, and then we settled for a while watching and analyzing what was being said and looking at my notes was would be capped out at 30,000. As you know now, sir, we exceeded 30 to 70,000. And, and, and all those people in 2009 a day, the need for PPE is increasing. It's not going down, sir. Right. So how many how many people are, are hospitalized right now with COVID? Nationwide. I don't have that number, sir. I don't okay. have that number. I know 70. Is it more or less than was anticipated two months ago? I think we're getting close to uh, what was originally projected uh, over a million to two million affected. I mean, how many hospitalized? That's really kind of the relevant thing. I don't have the number in front of me, so I, I didn't write that down from the morning notes. Okay, I'll, I'll give you one final question. I'm probably near my limit here. Um, I, I know of one example in which over $20 million was spent in a facility that almost certainly will not be used. Yes. And I could argue it was anticipated wouldn't be used at the time it was being built. Yes. Are you doing anything to monitor to make sure that we don't spend money Unnecessarily, are you updating the figures? And even if people ask for something, saying, "Well, maybe this is not necessary. Maybe we can back off." As I understand, there was that big ship, for example, in New York. Yes. It was barely needed. Obviously, you know, a, a big mistake was made. There. Well, I know it was a mistake, but at least I think more money was spent than was wise. Um, are, are you ever backing away from stuff or? That sort of thing. Uh, you know, uh, to, to the guy, to the people in the arena making the decisions and looking at what we, what they were projecting in the models that were coming out of the task force, uh, with all good intention, I think people thought they were going to need all those bed spaces. And when you take the combined impact of the hot spot with New York and New Jersey, uh, th that would have been a decision I probably would have said yes to or would have supported and then we were lucky enough to have the core engineer with their uh, ability to add some speed to this and show what the american military could do when we turn it loose working with the national guard they quickly built those uh, hospitals that being said i would rather be complaining about this now and having not done it and having needed it so Okay, well, we, we see where you're coming from. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Grothman. Next, we will go well, to... Well, thank you for Lynch. having me. Mr. Lynch, you are now unmuted. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, General, I did have an opportunity. I've been in Congress for a while. I did have an opportunity to observe your response down in at Katrina uh landed on the uh harry s truman and uh just want to thank you for the great job that you did and the leadership that you've shown uh one of the one of the problems that i see here is that when you look at at fema's mission statements and what we've all understood their role to be their mission statement says that they will take a lead role in in protecting the american people and in developing a comprehensive uh, response to those hazards to which uh, to which they are faced, uh, but in recent statements coming out of FEMA and coming out of the administration, uh, they 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 walk away from that. They say that they are not a first responder 
uh, organization. They're saying now that they are a, that the states are, are, are the lead agency really, and that they're really a stopgap uh, operation now. And, and just the lack of clarity and, uh, you know, the, the unity of command that, that, uh, that we saw at, at Katrina, uh, and, and that was just a, multi, a smaller group of states that were impacted. Uh, how, how do we reconcile that? And is, is that lack of clarity, do you think that that's a factor in the inability of FEMA to anticipate the, uh, you know, the, the amount of PPE, the amount of testing? Uh, is that, uh, I don't know, mission drift, I, I would call it. Uh, they, they were perceived by a lot of us because of their history as being a lead agency here. Now they seem to have abdicated that responsibility and, and are pushing it on the states uh, to handle in a situation where this contagion does not respect state borders. And so right. uh, many of our governors are, are at a loss to try to control what is outside of their borders. So if, if right. you could just speak to that. And again, I, I really do appreciate your, your uh, extensive uh, length of service and, and uh, the excellence that you've, you've, uh, you've shown in your own performance and, and your own responsibility. So I, I'll yield back with that. Thank you. Yes, I, I, I think, and I'll do this as quickly as I can. Uh, you know, prior to the organization of the Department of Homeland Security, uh, FEMA was an agency that responded to, almost directly to the president. So when something happened, it wasn't, uh, well, call over the director of home, uh, uh, the administrative Homeland Security, and let's see what FEMA can do. It was a direct response between the president and those governors on what was needed. And when Homeland Security was uh, organized, they were, in me being one of them, uh, were in the government, as well as I'm sure members of Congress questioned, should we put FEMA in with Homeland Security? Because now we've got an agency that's responsible for national security of the country, the borders, the CB customs and border patrol, F, you know, uh, T, uh, all sorts of organizations in Homeland Security and what impact that would have on FEMA's priority to be able to in statute as a federal agency to act independently and to save lives. And many of us can look with some concern that over the years, it's just another agency in Homeland Security. And I do think over the years, throughout the Obama administration, there was a movement to remind people after Katrina that we are not a 911. It's the governor's got this. And we, are, we support the governors, and the governors uh, are in charge. Well, okay, people who make that argument, what happened when the governor and his staff are, uh, are survivors, which was the case in New Orleans? When the government, the local government in the state doesn't have the ability to respond. And we can't wait for you to get there. The inherent responsibility under the under the Stafford Act was to save lives. And we did make some improvements after Katrina in that they pre-deployed toward disasters without anybody asking. They learned that lesson. But since then, there's been an attitude by many, and FEMA has supervised probably over a dozen committees in the Congress supervised them. There's been one more toward uh we resource, the states manage, and the cities and counties execute. I think we're missing something there, and I hope as y'all take a look at a review, we're asking them to do too much inside another agency as opposed to being independent and directly responding to the president without uh, waiting for the governors to ask for help, that they are offering help. That is their job. That's why they were created. We have mixed up the sheepdog with the Rottweiler. The Rottweiler protect the nation borders. 
and the sheepdog go in and save lives. We got to get that fixed, would be my recommendation. Thank you very much, General. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Lynch. Next, we will go to Ms. Talib. Ms. Talib, you are now unmuted. Thank you so much. And thank you, Chairwoman um, Maloney, um, for helping coordinate um, the continuation of the work of the committee. I sincerely appreciate it. Uh, General, thank you for joining us and sharing uh, your experiences in the past. As one of the newer members to Congress, I know, um, uh, you know, from even from afar, watching kind of the approach with the with the the, the awful tragedy of what happened with uh, Katrina, um, I could see that you know it involved a lot of coordination, but also uh, dealing with a lot of broken systems. And so, you know, my question to you is. You know, I represent uh, a very um, uh, diverse district in that I have very, very small local communities, a township, uh, some population of some of my cities are, you know, less than 10,000 people. And one of the things that I've been hearing, you know, is this outcry of, you know, many of the first responders um, getting uh, confirmed for COVID-19. Uh, the fact that it's now drained, as you had talked um, when my colleague, uh, Congressman Sarbanes, had mentioned, you had talked about uh, the fact that, you know, many of them were tapping into resources they didn't have. They were getting more and more into debt. And so our local communities, I feel like we're already very much in survivor mode, you know, similar to many of our neighbors across the country live check by check. Uh, you know, that's the majority of our neighbors. I don't care what district you're from. Most of the people we represent are living check by check. And so for a lot of my local communities, they want to see FEMA increase the reimbursement rate. They want to see it, you know, I know it has gone up to 90%, maybe during Katrina, and you can confirm or not, General. But, you know, there's a big push. Chairman DeFazio is, really wants to see this get at 100%. I'm very supportive of that. You know, I have county here that wants to help small businesses um, get grants to adjust their businesses so they can, uh, you know, comply with CDC guidelines and open up. Uh, they want to be able to uh, do a much more massive testing, especially in some of the more vulnerable communities. And I, I feel very strongly that we as a federal government should be a partner and get them a reimbursement rate of 100%. And I want to hear from you in regards to that. And I have another question if I have time. Yes, ma'am. I, uh, I think when we look at the burn rate that's happening in uh, cities and uh, in the states and uh, having to go out and compete to buy PPE as well as the overtime they have to pay to keep the citizens safe, uh, I would only say this, and I've heard this inside a couple of administrations. When you upfront go 100%, uh it this incentivizes the states to be careful in how much money they spend uh because there's been some history when you immediately give the hundred percent that people will spend this like it's federal money it's open checkbook the 25 percent remind the states that watch how you are spending this money and responsibility i would say that those who comply and have followed the rules, the states and the, the, the cities that have uh, lived with the federal rules in, in buying under the emergency actions and they've kept good records, that they should be awarded 100%. But you need to have some kind of control. But if you give everybody 100% right now, ma'am, I'm just telling you from past experience, we saw it in Katrina. Yeah, uh, we put one log in a truck and the truck was full. And the well, uh, you know, the problem, you know, and if you look at Chairman DeFazio's bill, it specifically says what should get reimbursed. The, you know, this this kind of notion that we're not having a global pandemic right now, where 70,000 of our fellow, you know, our neighbors across the country right. have died from it. And, uh, you know, point, well, I think it's a million point two have gotten this. This is a huge crisis. And, I understand we're always talking about fraud. We're always talking about yeah, all right, these things. Right, right. But at the same time, I have cities right now that are going to probably go bankrupt 
no fault of their own. Again, they're in survivor mode. Why? Because, you know, Michigan repealed the personal property tax. They've changed uh, revenue sharing where they cut them back 40%. So again, they already are at the bare minimum, right? right? And so, right, and then they get hit with the global pandemic that they were not prepared for. And so general, I, you know, even if it's 95 or 5%, whatever it is, but that's our responsibility as the federal government to yeah. oversee whether or not we should reimburse anybody, right? Like corporations, for instance. You're right. You're uh, right. General, we don't do the same standard with corporations. We do the bailouts. Do we say to them, did you keep the employees? Because I just, we just bailed out an airline that just laid off their employees. The whole point of bailing them out was so they can keep people working, right? And so I just think that we treat our local governments who are really the front line of combating this. They are the ones who are touching people's lives, not the federal government. Yes, they are the ones responding, their firefighters, our local uh, police officers, our public health departments in these counties. They're the ones at the front line that have to do this, uh, not the technically the federal government. So general, I, I would just push back because again, we cannot do that with, I mean, we haven't actually pulled back any money from those that shouldn't have gotten it from the corporate no. end. But we don't seem to, we seem to treat our local communities, our cities and townships who are literally begging for PPEs or begging to say, please give us some flexibility because we need to pay hazard pay. We You're need right. to make sure that we're protecting our, our first responders. Well, uh, let me say quickly what I learned, ma'am, from Katrina, and we didn't fix it 15 years later, our ability to get money to Americans had not improved. It was so bad after Katrina, we told the Red Cross to go give people money cards. Because the state of the federal programs, people who we knew their social security number, we know where they live, we couldn't get money to them. We had the Red Cross go stand under tents and give people money cards to go uh, buy food. But you know what? That's what we did at desperate times. We may have to do that again to keep our people from starving. And if that's what we have to do, we have to do it. The second thing we did, we created a system in FEMA. After a disaster, you go online and you tell FEMA your address, where you live, or what's your bank account, and the next day there's money in your account. I don't know why we're not using that system for people who need help. These state computers cannot handle unemployment. It's proven. All of them are slow. And, oh, no, I know. And, 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 and again, no fault of their own. So one of the things I just, just to my last point, in the state of Michigan, we hit a million um, uh, claims for unemployment benefits, and they had to increase. I think they even brought a private in, uh, company contractor to increase the number of caseworkers to process all of them. Again, they didn't have the capacity to deal with that, but they had to eat up that cost. And that's the thing that I, I you know, because I know what's going to happen. It's going to impact our public education. It is going to impact all these other services that we have in place that is really trying to, again, you know, protect our local economy. Uh, and so, uh, you know, you would like my automatic boost to Communities Act, General. Uh, I will be more than willing to share this with you, but it talks about debit cards. It talks about reoccurring payments. Every economist out there, and you know this, General, when you give money to our neighbors, to regular folks, they don't hoard it like corporations do. They actually spend it in the local economy. And my small businesses here tell me, more you give people money, they will spend it on on groceries, they will spend it on things that they, they need, again, stimulating the local economy. But I just that hope way, the Congress will work with the governors and no child should go hungry over this. Absolutely. We got, food, we got the Red Cross, we know how to get our cards. We got FEMA to get put money in people's pockets tomorrow night if we wanted to use that system. That none of our citizens starve as a result of this and that we secure the food chain we give our people what they need so they can stay in their homes and be safe. I hope y'all hold the, the administration and the governors to that standard. Thank you. I appreciate it. And as somebody that represents the third poorest congressional district, you know, one of four of my neighbors are now considered essential workers and they're putting their life on the line so that people can have groceries on the table. And I just hope we remember their, you know, to protect them, um, that they, they deserve human dignity and not to be considered disposable. Thank you so much, Chair General, and I, I yield, Chairwoman. Thank you, Ms. Tlaib. Just a reminder, we are going to our last and final question. If you guys, if any members want to ask a question, please raise your hand or send a, a message in the chat feature or um, in, via email. 
Next, we will go to Ms. Spear. Ms. Spear, you are now unmuted. Thank you, uh, Alisa. And Chairwoman, thank you so much for um, hosting this particular hearing. I must say, General Honore, it is, I could listen to you all day. You are, um, you are a leader, and I feel in many respects our federal response has lacked a, the kind of um, certainty that, that you exhibit. A couple of um, clarifications. You uh, were asked by Congressman Lynch about uh, FEMA. Now, based on what we're hearing, the National Response Coordinate, Coordination Center has been what they have uh, been in charge of, and mm -hmm. now it's review. It's actually recusing itself as the lead agency and looking at giving it to the Department of Health and Human Services. Do you think that's a good idea? Well, we, we do have plans. I would suggest y'all have to step uh, low, download the National Response Plan dealing with pandemics. And it recently been updated. You will see that as a code of responsibility of FEMA and resourcing those things and testing and requesting help from other agencies uh, and recording the uh, and providing money for dealing with the pandemic. And that's a co uh, lead by HHS with FEMA providing the life support and uh, supplies and stuff that's needed, as well as uh, funding through for uh, any DOD requirements that are needed. But, uh, but that plan exists, it's written. They have not necessarily followed it that way because I think the impact of creating the task force overrode what would normally would have happened with uh, HHS, the CDC dealing with the, the, the pandemic in itself and HHS dealing with the public health and FEMA providing the national assets that is needed to support the governors. So uh, thank you for that answer. The Defense Production Act, as, as we look um, at the last two and a half months, we now recognize that probably our greatest failing besides um, the lack of testing is not having the proper PPE. And frankly, without the proper PPE, you can't do the testing. And yeah. the need for PPE is gonna continue for months, um, maybe for years. So um, from my perspective, and I'd like your comment, the president invoked the Defense Production Act in name only, with the exception of asking General Motors to build ventilators. The PPE that is so desperately needed, the masks, the gowns, the swabs, um, that hasn't really been invoked for those purposes. So um, if we were to do this over, um, what would you be counseling the president to do? Matter of fact, you need to be counseled today to use the Defense Production Act. It's still not too late. We're going to be dealing with this for months to come, maybe a couple more seasons through next year with 2,000 people dying a day uh, to an unforeseeable future. You need to use it tonight and lean on some of these companies that have volunteered. The Honeywell volunteer. Good, good, good for them. We need to tell them how many we need them to produce and when. And we need to tell other companies to full garments, how many we need to produce and when. That needs to happen to date. Every day we delay waiting on PPE to fly in from China and India and Turkey and Italy, more of our people are gonna die unnecessary. I, I hate to say it that way, but we're wasting daylight. So we do need to use that act today and I hope uh, somebody from his team is listening. We need to produce the PPE and the testing and we need to use the Defense Production Act now. These companies have not stepped up as they originally proclaimed. It's not happening. We can't wait on Walmart to come up with PPE. That's a crying damn shame when we got Defense Logistics Agency, know where to order it, how to pay for it, and how to get it where we need it. So would you agree that the Defense Production Act was um, basically uh, invoked in name only? I think it was selectively used because there was a, uh, an, a, a, an attempt to try and use the private sector. Uh, you know, over the, the last uh, 
couple administration when something happened, all the CEOs fly up. You saw them fly up in the jets when the uh, when the car industry was going. You saw them fly down when the banking was called, and they became a part of the solution. That is not their job. It's the National Security Council job to come up with the response and the policies for the president, not the people who helped create it. The same people who sent all our production overseas, we're asking them to come in and volunteer to solve the problem. That's a shame. That shouldn't happen that way. And I hope the president tonight, before he go to bed, will sign the National Production Act that will create the testing and the kits that's needed, as well as the PPE produced in America by American companies, put American people to work. We got towns here in Louisiana that can use it. Most of our oil field is closed. We know how to make stuff. We got the Michoud plant in New Orleans. We got plants in Atlanta and Texas that can build this stuff. Tell them to do it and let's get it done, Mr. President. Thank you very much. And thank you for your extraordinary service to our country. I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Spear. And now we will um, give the floor back to Ms. Maloney for um, her closing statement. I, I just wanna say, General, I like your leadership style. I, I think your plan sounds a lot more efficient, effective, and equitable than what we've been laboring under. And I, I hope that uh, in this war against the coronavirus, which has already killed more people than died in the Vietnam War, it is, as you said, a war and we should use every uh, resource to combat it. Uh, microbes are killing more people than any missile and uh, we don't see the end of it. We don't see the end of it until we get the testing uh, that we need. And uh, I hope that this Congress can become unified and determined uh, to use the, the National Production Act to produce all of the tests that we need and all of the PPE we need right here in America. I hope we can work together to make that happen. I, I hope, I, I am from New York, that it is at the center of the, of the crisis. Uh, a third of the people that have died and that are suffering under the disease come from my city and my state. And uh, it is, uh, what can I say? It's, 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 uh, it's, it's too much death that could be prevented if we got the testing out there. Every country tells us, if you're gonna get over it, particularly Germany, South Korea, those that have uh, managed to get back to whatever the new normal is, uh, had to conquer the testing first, the PPE first, before you could move forward. And we need to do that. Um, I hope that uh, out of this hearing, we can have a joint push to make it in America and use the Defense Production Act the way it was framed to be used in times of war, which we're in. This virus is killing more people by the end of it, it'll probably kill more people than all of our wars combined. Uh, so it is a, a, a danger and we need to react on it today. And I, I can't thank you enough, General, for your service uh, uh, at Katrina and every other place and for being with us today. And I, I hope people hear your, your words of wisdom. I, I certainly did. And I wanna thank you for your time and, and your, your generosity of spirit to, to spend uh, your time with us and your advice and your wisdom. We should follow it. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you for your unity of effort. You and your uh, colleagues there on both sides. Uh, and I wish y'all have good uh, success in solving these issues of providing uh, the PPE and the testing we need for our nation, as well as making sure none of our citizens go hungry. If we have to tell the Red Cross to go issue cars on the corner, that's what we do. We cannot go back to the depression where people are standing in line for a plate of food. We need to take, make sure our people are taken care of. And I hope members of Congress will put the spotlight on that and, and make sure that our people uh, have food and housing because this could come down if we continue this slippery slope, well, it, we'll start looking like a third world country. We gotta stop acting like one. Thank you, Chairwoman. We have one more question from Mr. Raskin. Mr. Raskin. You are now unmuted. Well, well, I just want to thank General Honoré for his extraordinary service and for his plain spokenness. And I hope the whole nation will listen at this point. We need to have coordinated logistics through the national government of the United States. And as I was listening to General Honoré, I was reflecting, it's like we've been taken back 
to the Articles of Confederation before we had a constitution. It was every state for itself. All the states were fighting against each other for material and logistics. And that's why we had a constitution. And as the general just said, uh, let's act like a first class democratic country. Let's not become a failed state. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Raskin. Um, this concludes our um, question and answer period. Um, Ms. Maloney, the floor is back open to you. Uh, thank the general enough. And I think we should act on his advice and his direction. I think we should Republicans and identify uh, Republicans and Democrats should come together in a unified and determined uh, approach to get the PPE and the testing done right here in America, built in and here in America. We've got 30 million people unemployed. Let's put them back to work, uh, making uh, the, the, the supplies that we need to take care of the people in our country. And, uh, and we need to activate the National Response Plan and the Defense Protection Production Act, uh, hopefully today. Uh, so I yield back. I thank all the members on both sides of the aisle that participated. And uh, General, we thank you so much for your service and for being with us and for your humanity and reminding us that we have to take, make sure that we have a, not only the, the ways to, to cure ourselves and test ourselves, but to take care of the people that need the food. And it's been a big part of our, our COVID uh, relief plans and it will continue to be, but your passion uh, inspires me. Thank you. Thank you and uh, good luck to our public health people who are leading this. Thank you. Wow. Thank you all. This concludes our briefing.